Um, Pocana is the Center for Optimization, Convex Analysis, and Non-Smooth Analysis. That's the center that I do my research in at the University of British Columbia on the Kelowna campus. A lot of co-authors here. I'll try to point out as I go along uh, where they fit into things. But I'll say for now that Ewen is, did all of this research as an undergraduate student. Uh, so the portion where you see where she's involved is phenomenally impressive. Uh, Gabriel Zary Bulduk has actually visited here before, so you may have met him. And I don't think Shane Planeton ever came to Montreal, but certainly some of you have met him at conferences. And Shane's now a professor at uh, Wollongong in Australia. I've been flipping too much. <clears throat> I don't think I actually need to tell you what derivative free optimization is in this crowd, but I'm going to start with a black box optimization problem anyhow. And then we'll just fast forward the part where I explain what DFO means. So in this particular problem, <clears throat> this is a problem from medical physics. So what we're looking at here is a hunk of gel, this, this tube, and a laser that gets shined through the gel and a bunch of detectors on the back row. You take the gel and you shine the laser through and you see how much light gets through and you rotate the gel over and over and over again. And doing that, you can build a 3D image of the opacity of the gel and how it's shaped. This is super important because what they do with MRI machines, um, sorry, with radiotherapy machines, is before they use them on a patient, they use them on gel. So every single time a cancer patient is coming in to get radiotherapy, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take the machine, they're going to put the treatment plan in, they're going to use it on a tube of gel, and then they want to check if the gel reacted as predicted. Okay, Because these machines are wildly dangerous. They're literally designed to kill small portions of your body. You want to make sure the portions you kill are the portions that you're trying to kill. So uh, the hospital, they do this with every single patient. So they need to be able to do this effectively, quickly, and accurately. So that's what the medical uh, part of the medical research group does at UBC Okanagan. And in 2001, Andy Ogilvy, PhD student, created a simulation where he tried to figure out the best design for a new detector. They finally got the budget to upgrade things. And so he wanted to make it work well. His design is partly based on simulation software done by an undergraduate student that left several years earlier and partly his own code. So there's a mix of stuff he really grasps and a mix of stuff he does. The code shoots in a laser, figures out all of the refractive indexes every time it hits one of these boundaries, and then determines how much laser light, if you put in a blank slate, would hit each detector. What you want is every detector to get a minimum amount of light and every detector to get roughly an equal amount of light. So he measures that with three different metrics, each one between zero and one, and you want to maximize the sum of those three metrics. So that creates this problem where he has a number of parameters to determine where things can go. And that gives you the shape of that acrylic block you saw. And you want to maximize the quality of the acrylic block. Now, he wasn't quite happy he did that and he found out that it's very, the simulation is very unstable. Moving, getting the measurements off by a millimeter could change the quality by 0.1. So he threw in the second part where he said, I actually want the robust maximum. So I want the maximum of the minimum of the acrylic quality of the block over all blocks within a radius of epsilon of X. So you can see you have a, a nested problem. This part right here, we're treating as a black box. <clears throat> What's the uh, compared to X? Z, Z is in the ball of radius X, so we're taking the minimum over all of those. Because of this part, this is a fairly slow computation. Just computing the quality is quick, but to compute the, the minimum over a ball of radius epsilon, the simulation he built samples lots of points in the ball of radius epsilon and takes the minimum of those points. Can't remember how many points, but the end result is the simulation takes uh, 30 seconds, I think, to finish. To get one, you pick one value of X, it gives you an output. 
<clears throat> All right. So this is the part I'm really going to fast forward. This is what's called a black box optimization problem. I know you two are in Charles's class. Are you in taking Charles's class too? No, this is new to you? This is uh, ish. Okay, yeah. well, we, can go, we can go a little slower then. So black box optimization is any problem where part of the optimization objective function is a black box. We can't look into it. We can't figure out gradients and hessians. We can't pull it apart. And, and treat it like it's got special structures. It's just, I give this simulation a number and it outputs a different one. I give a vector, it outputs a vector. This particular problem has five variables, which for a non-black box problem is a trivially small problem, right? Five variables, you could probably take the gradient by hand if you had a five variable function. You could write the Hessian on a sheet of paper and then you could use Newton method. Boom, it'd be done. But with a black box problem, we can't do any of that. And so it actually five variables is fairly large. And every time you want to get a function value, you're looking at 30 seconds. So if you want to say, I want a thousand function values, you're looking at 30,000 seconds, right? That's 10 hours of computation time. That's a long time. <laughs> Uh, Derivative-free algorithms, which is what I'm going to talk about today, and is the main focus of my study over the last research over the last um, five to ten years, are optimization algorithms that don't explicitly use derivatives. These are obviously ideal for black box optimization. However, you can apply them to anything you want. Not necessarily a good idea. If I give you a linear program, you could apply everything I'm about to tell you and you would get crushed if somebody else came along and did the simplex. Right? But you could do it. However, if I give you a black box optimization problem, you don't have a lot of other choices. So I gave you one example. Here's a bunch more. There's a survey paper in 2020-ish, I think, by Ade and it's, I guess, or the Digabel and a bunch of other people. That lists off about a thousand applications. Um, I picked out some of my favorites from that paper. Uh, I had to throw this one in just to make Sebastian feel good. <laughs> Solar power plant design. Um, the helicopter blade is an interesting one because this is, to my knowledge, the first published application of black box optimization. And healthcare is fun because it's my first published application of black box optimization which somehow feels important to me. Okay, if you wanna see applications, I can give you a copy of the survey paper. There's huge numbers. Okay. We'll come back to that physics one at the end of the talk and I'll show you how things worked. Um, but for now, let's get on to more research question style and show you what kind of I try to solve and, and how it works. So I'm gonna look at what's called model-based derivative-free algorithms. So in a model-based algorithm, what we want to do is we want to take a classical algorithm and we want to replace the true gradient, the true Hessian, whatever it needs, with some approximation. And if we do those approximations in a clever way, we're hopefully going to still get convergence. Let's start with a true algorithm. So this is one I hope everyone recognizes. Anybody not know what that one is? Good, so you're too embarrassed to say it. If you don't, this is Newton's method, right? It is the epitome of gradient-based optimization because of this sentence right here, it converges quadratically, right? It's the best you can get in terms of convergence rates. You need a couple of conditions, in particular, you need to start reasonably close and you need to be, your Hessian to be invertible for the obvious reason of I'm gonna take the inverse of the Hessian a lot. <laughs> it's always written in this way, but this condition is actually saying I need the Hessian to be invertible nearby X star, right? Because I have F being C3, so the Hessian is continuous, and I have XK is sufficiently close. So invertible at X star means invertible nearby as well. C2. C2 is not sufficient to get quadratic convergence because you need to apply, and I'm gonna show you why, because we're gonna apply Taylor's theorem. And to get quadratic convergence, I'm gonna take a, 
first order Taylor expansion of the gradient, which means I need a third derivative to get this big O of X squared term. Okay, I can get away with C2 plus, but. <clears throat> okay, so there's a first order Taylor expansion of the gradient. So the gradient is equal to the gradient at a point plus the Hessian at a point multiplied by the difference between those two points. And your error term is a square of the difference between the two points. You can immediately see where I've used XK needs to be close to X star. This is only true if I'm close. Okay. <clears throat> I'm taking my Taylor expansion at X star, or sorry, at XK to approximate F, the gradient of F of X star. But I know the gradient of F of X star is zero because that's the solution. So making that zero, this says the norm of the leftover term is less than or equal to some constant times that difference squared. All right, so that's gonna be our powerhouse. Now let's take a look at X star minus XK plus one, replace XK plus one by what it actually is, factor out the inverse Hessian, use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, and boom, you have this norm is less than or equal to some constant multiplied by x star minus xk squared. And that is the definition of quadratic convergence. Wow, that's it. One, two, three, four lines. Taylor's theorem plus four lines, you get quadratic convergence. You don't get shorter proofs than that. <clears throat> what if I replace all of those gradients and all of those Hessians with approximations? That's what I question I'd like to ask. That's the, the driving force of the research I do. What if I replace everything with approximations? Do things still work? So we're going to need a little language here. Uh, we're going to call F tilde delta a uh, model, and we'll call a group of them a class of models. So the idea is you give me a point that you're interested in building a model at, you give me a delta, and I give you a model. The point of interest has to be something you know, because you're giving, I'm giving you the model for that point of interest. So our point of interest is always gonna be XK. And a good model, as delta goes to zero, the model should become more accurate, okay? That, that's our control. We wanna be able to say things get better. However, we wanna be able to be honest about it and say, we know it gets better, but we don't know exactly how it's better. And so we bring up this idea of order and accuracy. So this looks similar to those Taylor results in that I've got the difference of two things is less than or equal to a constant multiplied by something to a power of n, delta to the power of n. So delta is my, my control parameter. I can push that to zero. And as I push that to zero, <laughs> the n will go to zero. And I even know how fast it will go to zero. This kappa f or kappa g or kappa h, I don't know what those values are, but I know they're constants, okay? So in Taylor's theorem, those values are linked to the maximums of the derivative below whatever derivative you took things to. We're gonna have similar results later, but for now, it's just this concept of, I don't know the actual value, but I know it's constant as long as I don't change X. And that is what I'm gonna call order N accuracy. Function, gradients, and Hessian are self-apparent self as to where they went to. Okay, you can do it at X, or you could do it near X by just saying, I need those conditions to hold in some ball nearby. In this talk, we're just gonna focus with at X. That's actually all we're gonna need. It turns out that's all you really need for most things. <clears throat> so let's take Newton's method. Let's replace our true Hessian with an approximate Hessian. So I have a model. And let's replace our true gradient with an approximate gradient. So I have a model that gives me that information. I still need XK to be sufficiently close. That's not a big surprise. Instead of the true Hessian being invertible, now I need the model to be invertible. And actually what I used in the previous proof was that the norm of the true Hessian was bounded above nearby. So I'm just gonna assume that straight out. The norm of the models Hessians are bounded above as long as XK and delta K are sufficiently close. So this measure is, it, is that the uh, conditioning of the matrix? This guy? Yeah. Or something that is the 
It could be. So I, right now, I haven't told you how I'm building the models. And so I don't want to talk about condition numbers and stuff. But if I build the models in the way that I'm going to by the end of this talk, then you're correct. Okay. Okay. I'm going to want the models to give me some level of accuracy. It turns out what I need is order two gradient and order one Hefsim. Okay. And you'll see in the proof where that number is coming from. And I'm going to assume those constants are bounded above. Again, I don't know what they are, but I just want to say that as I get close, they don't shoot off to infinity. So I want my models to remain accurate no matter how, what, what K is, what X K is. And then I got this last condition, which is a little technical, but it's saying the accuracy of the model is linked to the distance you are from the solution. So the closer you get to the solution, the more accurate model you need to have. Okay, we're just going to leave that one as technical. This is the type of thing that you would check uh, in your algorithm by looking at things like x minus xk plus one to get an approximation of this, and then check that delta was sufficiently small or some other technique. But for now, we're just going to use the, the brute force of what we need. Here's the old proof. I had to shrink things. All I've done, so that line's exactly the same, right? That's Taylor's theorem still. These three lines don't change except for the fact that everywhere there was a function, there was a model. And I can get all the way down to here, and then I get stuck because this is not this. And this is not the Hessian, it's the approximate. This guy's okay though, because I've already got an assumption that says this number is bounded. So I'm gonna be able to get rid of that easy enough. And this guy <laughs> is gonna disappear just by pulling in my gradient and Hessian accuracy. So these are my accuracy assumptions. And I just do my classical technique of add and subtract the truth. And then you can say, well, due to the accuracy assumption, this distance is small and this distance is small. So I'm good there. This distance is small from our previous proof. And there it is. So I changed a four line proof into a six line proof, but I still get quadratic convergence. Okay, I had to put a lot of assumptions on the models there but I still got quadratic convergence without using the actual gradient or Hessian. That's a pretty amazing result in my mind, especially for six lines. <laughs> Couple notes, if you back up and you replace delta K equal to zero, then you actually just get the original proof back. I'm not using any second order information, but I got quadratic convergence. That's a pretty rare statement in the world of optimization. Quadratic convergence usually hinges on second order accuracy, having a second order object. This of course leads to the big question of, well, that's great, but you made a lot of bold assumptions there. Can you actually tell me a way to satisfy any of them? And that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of today's talk doing is saying, yes, yes I can. We can build these models and we can make this work. <clears throat> all right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna wash the model under the rug and say, all I really need to do is approximate gradients and Hessians. And from that, I can build models. Here's the, the way to do it using gradients. Um, so if I build a gradient and the gradients has order one accuracy. I didn't define that, but I'm gonna let you visualize in your head what it would mean. Then you can build the model and it's super simple. You just say, I'm gonna use the model where the function value at the point of interest is the right one. And then it has a slope of that. So I use the gradient to make a tangent plane that goes through things. And I get a model with order two function accuracy. And there's the proof. So I'm really not interested in building the whole model. I am, but... I don't need to build the whole model. What I really need to do is build an approximate gradient and an approximate S. So let's take a look at gradients first. They're easier. Um, those of you that have taken the GFO course here, this should probably look familiar. I'm sure Charles spent at least a week on it. I'm gonna do it in 10 minutes. <clears throat> the exam's Thursday? Yes. Perfect. This is your 10 minute study brush course for the exam. 
Easiest possible way to build a gradient based a model with a gradient would be a linear function. Right? A linear function looks like this: alpha naught plus alpha transpose x. <clears throat> so if I want to build a linear function, I'm going to need n plus one points because there's alpha naught and there's n things in alpha. And I'm just going to evaluate those points and then do linear interpolation that goes through all those points. So that is, I'm going to build a system of equations where mx is equal to alpha naught plus alpha transpose x. And every time I evaluate mx at a point y naught, y1, y2, I want to get f of y naught, f of one one for y2. Okay, so it's an n plus one by n plus one linear system. And as long as this matrix is invertible, you can solve the system, that gives you a model, and that model gives you a gradient. Okay, so this is called linear interpolation, and we call it poised for linear interpolation if the functions in the matrix in question is invertible. If you do linear interpolation, and I set delta to be the sampling radius, so I take the, the ball centered at y naught, and I say, how big does it have to be to hold all the points? Then you end up with a model, f tilde, and our delta comes from there. And that model has order two function and order one gradient accuracy. This is a classical result dates back to before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> Not before I was born. <laughs> I, I might be guessing there too. Dates back to late 90s, 98, 99. Um, so it's amazing what you call classic in math at this point, isn't it? <clears throat> so I won't go through the proof of that. What I will point out is that you can do a shortcut, right? I told you earlier that I don't actually want the whole model. I just want the gradient. And if you looked at Newton's method, you saw that too. I never actually used the model anywhere. I used the gradient in S. Okay. So if I just want the gradient, it turns out you can get the gradient by this magic trick right here. So alpha was the gradient of that linear model. And you take D inverse delta F. So delta F is you take the difference between f of y1, f of y0, f of y2, f of y0, and d is the differences between y1 minus y0, y2 minus y0, and so on. So we're going to switch notation a little bit and think of y1 as y0 plus d1, y2 plus y0 plus d2, and so on, to give you d and delta in a cleaner manner. And there I have it. The proof for this is easy. Here's our original linear system. Do one iteration of Gauss Jordan elimination. So you take this one and cancel all these ones with it. So that means I'm subtracting the top row from every row underneath, and I get a column of zeros. And look at that matrix. That's D, that's alpha. So if you look at this system, the bottom n times n portion of the system doesn't use the first component at all and is invertible matrix D. And so I have alpha is D inverse times delta. Uh, just because, uh, so I'm thinking of D as column vectors, which makes all of these columns, which means that when I actually build this, they're all in rows here. So this is actually D transpose. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually really did that just to keep in line with the classical notation. <clears throat> so, if you give me a point of interest and you give me a list of sampling directions, then I can create a sample set. And from that sample set, I can create my difference vector. So, point of interest, sampling directions, difference vector. Sample set is just a, a middleman on the way. And using those three things, I can build my approximate gradient. So I'm going to call that the simplex gradient. And the reason for that is your sample set is well poised if and only if it forms a simplex. Okay. So here's my notation. I'm putting a little S here to tell me that it's an approximation. So it's not a true gradient. This is a simplex gradient. Why not? It's the point of interest. D is the sample of directions. And from that, I just showed you. You can obviously get the inverse and you can get delta f through difference vector. So there it is. Boom. How does it do? 
Um, well, we're actually going to, well, we know how it is, right? Because this we showed earlier is the gradient from linear interpolation, so we know it has order one gradient factors. Well, I wanted order two. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> not good enough. To get order two, we're going to have to be a little bit more clever. And while we're clever, we're going to do some other cool stuff on the way. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what if instead of n sampling directions, I had m? So m could be too many, it's more than n, or it could be too few, less than n. So if it's too many, you need you still need these directions to be independent. If it's too no, not necessarily. You'll see. Okay, but you'll see. I, there are going to be some assumptions in there, but that's not actually one of them. And I can explain the details in about three slides. Okay. okay. If n is not n, then d is not square. If d is not square, I can't write inverse. Okay, but what I can write is pseudo inverse. So that's the inverse, power of minus one. This is the pseudo inverse. It's a dagger. I don't know why they use dagger for pseudo inverse, but everybody does. And I can replace my approximate gradient with just the pseudo inverse times the difference vector. So I can define this difference vector the same way, and I just change an inverse to a pseudo inverse. If you haven't seen a pseudo inverse before, this is what it is. It is the magic matrix that does these four things. And in particular, don't worry about the four things. What's important to know is that in Rn, it's very easy to compute. In fact, in, in something like MATLAB, where if you wanted the inverse of D, you go I, N, V, brackets, D, N brackets, you go P, I, N, V, brackets, D, N brackets. It's that easy. The pseudo inverse just puts a P in front of the I. <laughs> And if you are used to use the power of minus one, what do you do? Uh, I, I, you should never do that in MATLAB. <laughs> well, you should never do that in MATLAB. Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you changed to PINV, and I, I don't know the name in Fortran or Python or stuff, but I, I do know that there is a command for pseudo inverse in Python and C. You probably do that library, and, and basically every reasonable programming language. You don't just have to look it up. <clears throat> so now we have what I'm going to call the generalized simplex gradient. And that's what we're going to work with for the next 10 minutes or so. So now we're getting into the answer of Sebastian's question. So if m is equal to n and you're invertible, then you get the simplex gradient back, right? And that's obvious because if D pseudo inverse is equal to D inverse, then this definition gives me this next. So generalized simplex gradients are reasonable then. If M is less than N, then this is the definition of the pseudo inverse. Okay, so you can see why it's so easy to compute. There's a closed form formula for it, and it will actually give you the solution to this problem. It gives you the minimum Frobenius norm um, of the vector g, so this is the gradient you're looking for, that solves the problem. So we have too few directions, so there's more than one answer, so it takes the easiest one. Are you sure that? It's a bit far for me, but I, I remember, I kind of remember that when you have more co uh, more rows than columns, it means... Uh, so this is, is this is because I'm doing that detranspose at the end. Right, so it's this transpose here. Oh, okay, oh, okay. Get rows and columns in your head. Okay. So trust me, I've checked this slide like 18 times. Think of it as M is the number of sampling directions. So if you have too few sampling directions, but then the sampling direction is a column. Yes. Okay, so okay. It so will be. Yeah. N is the number of columns, not the number of rows. Right. So it's not the usual. So everything's, everything's flipped from what you want it to be in your head. Yeah. Okay. If n is bigger than n, you have too many sampling directions, which means you might not have a solution, right? You have too much data to solve your problem. When you have too much data to solve your problem, you take the least square solution. Okay. And it, the d pseudo inverse gives this form, and this simplex gradient is that. So in all three situations, you're getting back an object that kind of makes sense. And um, in all three situations, you have a very easy, easy, 
way to find those single inverses. So my question before was about the way to find Yeah, the and here's where the rank's going to come in. So up till now, I have not had to make any assumptions on rank. Here is where I do. Um, oh, I should have said that as, this should say if D is full rank. Did not, it, it, I didn't define before. why it's close. It was a before. It was on the previous slide. Really? At the bottom. Oh, at the very top, D is full rank, oh, right? The bottom, yes, so this formula and this formula <coughs> need full rank in order to be true. Uh, and of course, you need full rank to be invertible. It's equivalent of your square matrix. And so if D is full rank, you can actually have overdetermined, so too many sample points, and some of those sample directions being identical and still be full rank. All you're doing is you're repeating yourself. Okay. Okay. But the, uh, in that case, yes, it would be full row rank because you have two many points. Yes. Okay. So if if you're not if you have two columns that are linearly independent, then you're probably not full rank. I can still define the generalized simplex gradient. The definition still makes perfect sense, but the result I'm about to show you won't necessarily be true. And this is the result that matters. <laughs> so you don't want that to happen, but technically there's nothing wrong with it happening. Okay. So if that D is full row rank, then you get an error. Rank. So this was first proved in 2008 by Castillo, Dennis, and Vicente. Uh, what I'm showing you, though, is the 2015 version because I really liked Regis's presentation on this. What he says is the error between your simplex gradient and the true gradient is not actually what you want to look at. What you want to look at is the error between the simplex, the projection of the simplex gradient onto the span of D and the projection of the true gradient onto the span of D. So D is your sampling directions. If you've only sampled in a subspace, then you project everything to that subspace. If you've sampled every direction in Rn, then your projection doesn't do anything because the projection of something onto Rn is itself. And then you get an error bound. So you get the square root of the number of points you use, divided by two, the Lipschitz constant of the true gradient, and you get this condition number of the pseudo inverse. And then you get a delta. What's important here is that as delta shrinks, those first three terms are going to stay the same. So as delta shrinks, I can make my error go to zero in a controllable way, right? Here is my kappa g, and there is my delta to the power of one. So this generalized simplex gradient provides order one gradient accuracy on the subspace that you have sampled in. Outside of that subspace, you can't say it. And it's actually super easy to make an example that shows why you can't. But I wanted order two. Uh-oh. So let's get order two. How do we get order two? We think back to first year calculus, maybe, if you had a, a professor that pushed you hard, or maybe first year numeric, third year numeric, second year numerical analysis, if you didn't. You take Taylor's theorem twice. You say f of x plus h and f of x minus h. There's my Taylor expansions. Let's subtract <laughs> the second line from the first line, so the f's cancel, and the norm, the f prime primes cancel, and so I get twice f prime plus big O of h3. Let's divide by 2h, and I get this plus f prime <laughs> of h squared. There is the delta squared that I want. There is the formula I need to get. Okay, this is called the centered divided difference. Um, and our question is, can we make this work in simplex gradients? Well, it turns out the answer is yes, and it's beautiful. It's beautifully easy. All I have to do is say, make D, that set of sampling direction, be symmetric. So it needs to be composed of two parts, D plus and D minus, where D minus is the exact opposite of D plus. That's it. That's all I really did in that last one. 
is I said, I have two directions, left and right, and I'm gonna use them both. Here I have M directions, but I'm gonna use both the positive and negative of every sample in direction. Okay, so if that's the case, I'll use a C and put D plus here, or I can just stick with an S and use D because D is the union of those two things. <clears throat> Uh, so it turns out that the centered simplex gradient, it's pretty obvious immediately that if I put use the centered and use D plus, or if I use the centered and use D minus, I get the same thing, right? Because I've just swapped things. And in fact, I can use portions from plus and portions to minus as long as they line up correctly. And in fact, you get the average of the two simplex gradients. Moreover, you get that exact same error bound, except our Lipschitz constants now the Hessian, and we've got an M over six instead of over two, um, but most importantly, delta squared, right? So if I use this symmetry technique, then I can get delta squared. Of course, I doubled the number of points I need to use, so there's so much to work there, but I got delta squared, and that's what I wanted at the beginning of this talk. Questions? Where's my clock? All right, I'm gonna take a tiny detour in fast forward. We're coming a little short on time. Um, this is just fun research. This is the part by Yuan. I asked her, what if I give you D plus and instead of giving you D minus, I give you something really close to it, but not quite it. Uh, so this wouldn't necessarily happen in MADS, but imagine You've got some subroutine in MADS for the people who are familiar with it. And that subroutine has to round things to the mesh. And in rounding things to the mesh, you get things off a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Doesn't matter why we're off a little bit, but the question I posed to her was if I'm off a little bit, what happens? And I said, so this, the definition shouldn't change. And she came back to me a week later and said, actually, the definition should change because if the definition doesn't change, you get nothing. But if you change the definition, then you get good things. She said, to change the definition, you should first say, how am I wrong? So this D tilde is supposed to be negative D1, but perhaps it's too long or too short. So you have a stretching factor and perhaps it's wiggled a little bit in some direction or another. So you have an angle, theta i. You take that stretching factor and that theta i and you stick it into the definition like this. And you have to also edit the, the difference vector like this. Okay, so this is just taking into account that you already, you know what you should have wanted and you didn't quite get it. Then the error between the, uh, this adjusted gradient and the true gradient still gets this delta squared, but also takes this theta into account. So if theta is small, or maybe even zero, then you get something really close to delta squared. If theta is big, then you get something more akin to delta. So by taking this adjustment into account, you get that. If you don't take this adjustment into account, then you cover up that theta and you get that. So by doing the adjustment, you can put the theta into the error bound, which is really nice because if theta is small, it means you can you can recognize that in your error bound. Okay, that was a, just a quick detour because I was so impressed with her work. She deserves to be allotted a little bit. <clears throat> At the beginning of the talk, I said, when we look through mutants, order two gradient, we just did that. Order one Hessian. So we need Hessian stuff. Whew. Let's back up. Quadratic interpolation, blah, blah. Now let's not do that. Quadratic interpolation is insane. Nobody should ever do it. It takes forever to code. It's ripe with errors. It's hard to analyze. Instead, let's just jump straight past the interpolation and go right to our shortcut from the generalized simplex group. Okay. The shortcut was you build a difference vector and you multiply it by an inverse matrix or a pseudo inverse. In this case, my difference vector is going to be the difference of the gradients. But I don't have gradients, so it's going to be the difference of the simplex gradients. And then my inverse is going to be C. 
So I've got two sets of sampling directions now. The first set tells me what directions to determine simplex gradients at. The second set is used to build those simplex gradients. You can make these two things exactly the same, and that's generally the easiest to do. But as you can see, the actual equation's simple. If I asked you to code this, you do a for loop to code this, and then you multiply it by P I N V bracket C N. That's it. Okay, really simple to implement. Uh, I've done it myself. It took me three lines. Um, I probably could have done it in two if I put that, you know, like four I equals one to this and then pushed it all into one line for giggles, but I didn't. <clears throat> the only catch is you need to have the generalized simplex gradient already coded. But that also is easy to code, as you saw it. And does it work? The answer is yes. You get an error bound that looks exactly like what you want it to look like. So if you have C and D both be full rank, then you get a constant. You get that condition number from C, the condition number from D, and delta. So order one Hessian accuracy. <clears throat> Moreover, if C and D are both <coughs> symmetric, so you need symmetry on both levels, you can actually get order two Hessian accuracy. But since you're actually multiplying the number of points in D by the number of points in C in order to figure out how much you're evaluating, this, this is going to be a lot of work. Um, and I will say, um, things get more complicated when C and D, so I've made in this case, over-determined, right? So I have at least, I'm sampling in all of Rn in both C and D. In the underdetermined case, things get complicated because you could have one thing D not sample in Rn and then C sample in all of Rn. And what is that going to do and stuff? Uh, we do have some results on that, but it's too complicated to throw into this talk. And I wouldn't say it's fully understood. Okay, so now we can do it. We can get order two gradient. We can get order one Hessian. Let's go back to that simulation and let's give it a try. So quick reminder, this is the problem. Maximize the quality of a new um, <clears throat> new solid state tank design. So uh, in 2015, when the first round of simulation was built, they used it to make a solid state tank. And they did that just by Professor Jurassic sitting down with his students and saying, I think these parameters will work best. And they plugged it in and they were happy with the number. Okay. So we have a 2015 design, which was made by expert intuition. <clears throat> In 2021, I think, uh, when Andy finished his first simulation, he said, aha, I know how to optimize this, grid search. Everybody remembers grid search? Everybody remembers what uh, Dr. Rade says about grid search? Um, but he did it, uh, five by five by five by five by five grid. Okay, so you can multiply all that out and you get somewhere in the, thousand-ish function evaluation, so it, it takes overnight to finish. Um, <clears throat> shortly after that, my master's student, Dominique, had developed a piece of software where he was trying to do was figure out a method to automatically detect when you should switch from a direct search method to a model-based method, when you think you're close enough and you want that to get that extra oomph in accuracy. So he had this coded up and um, he gave it a try, so it starts with a generalized pattern search and it ends with Newton's method and it has this kind of automated switching procedure to determine when to make that switch. And here are the results. First off, 2.84, so that's the original design. That's pretty good, right? And we got a score that goes from zero to three and we're maximizing, so 2.84. Expert intuition in this case was solid. Um, <clears throat> Grid search did ever so slightly better than, uh, than the intuition, but not really. 
Grid search, so water, FlexiDose, and Clearview are three different uh, types of gel that you can put between the cylinder and the plexiglass, and it causes different refractions. So you end up with the same problem or a similar structure problem with different solutions due to tiny tweaks. Um, and you can see in the grid search, it bombed on the water, 2.5. Uh, Dominique's derivative-free method did better in every case and did noticeably better with their view. So the big question that Dr. Jurassic really wanted an answer to is, should we flick change from Clearview to FlexiDose, FlexDose 3D, this new gel that came on the market? Um, and he's decided the answer is no, not because this number is bigger than this number, but because this is 10 times as expensive as this one. And so he was only going to switch if this number was significantly bigger than this number. Can we build a new tank that's better than the current one? There, the answer is yes. It's always a little hard to gauge these things. If you think of this as a number between zero and three, then it doesn't look like much improvement. But if you think of this as, well, I can throw a dart and get 2.4 or 2.5. Um, so if we think of this as a number between 2.5 and 3, this is a big improvement. So the good news is they built the new uh, device and, and it works well. All right, so uh, what I've talked about today is order and accuracy and how it provides a language to discuss gradient and model quality um, and how you can use that language to develop proofs of convergence without even telling me what the models are. So I think that's a really nice property, separating the how are you building the models with the how are you making things converge, because they are really separate processes. I talked about the simplex gradient, generalized simplex gradient, generalized centered simplex gradient, adjusted centered simplex gradient, and a generalized centered as generalized simplex Hessian. Well, basically, I showed you a bunch of ways to approximate gradients and Hessians, and I showed you the type of error bounds that you can get. Okay, the details of that. Then read the papers. In showing you the stuff, um, I think there's a couple of really obvious open directions. In the adjusted centered simplex gradient, imagine the situation where you have a genetic algorithm or just a random search. You plop down lots of points. You think you know where the solution is. You have a swarm of points around it, and you want to build the best accurate gradient nearby. How would you do that? You would have to select the points in a way that you line things up with the opposites, right? Which sounds easy, and if I draw it in R2, it's super easy. But if I ask you how do you make a computer do it, it's not so obvious. Similar question for a generalized simplex Hessian. I give you a swarm of points, and I say, what's the minimum number of new points you can do to give me a, a high accurate Hessian approximation, and where should they be? Um, again, in R2, it's easy. How do you get a computer to do it not obvious? So two really good open directions if you want to go there. You want to know more about derivative free optimization, take Charles's course or read Charles's book. You want to know more about gradient approximations, here are the uh, references from this talk. 